Good day and welcome to my YouTube channel. I am Atro Francis Deban. Today we will be dealing with um, dealing with um, chemistry again. The topic is qualitative analysis. So permit me because um, today's class is more like revision. So I wouldn't be writing much perhaps. So qualitative inorganic analysis is our interest. We say qualitative analysis is a part of chemistry practicals that deals with the determination of constituent of substances, whether organic or inorganic. But our focus is today in inorganic. Inorganic qualitative analysis involves identification of anions, which are called the acid radicals, and cations, which are metallic radicals, of unknown inorganic salt. And the results are often recorded under headings as test, observation, and inference. Now, identification of cations. So we are going to talk about the, how cations, the metallic uh, ions can be identified. We're going to talk about the anions, uh, the acid radicals, how they can also be identified. So I'm going to give us an overview because this thing is important that it has to be it has to be resident in us that uh, when we get into the lab, we can officially carry out the practicals without much trouble. I will bring forth a video that will have to show the live practicals, okay? So, but for the time being, this is what it is. So let's talk about how can we identify the cations in the lab? Example, if a compound were to be having like zinc chloride or zinc, uh, whatever it is, the cationic part there is the zinc, and I want to identify it in the lab. What am I going to do? So all that is important. So the cations are the positive charge ion. Example, we have the zinc ion, aluminum ion, lead, calcium ion, ion two and ion three ions, copper two ions, ammonium ion, etc. Now to identify these cations, we will use the precipitation reaction method. That is adding a suitable reagent. The suitable the reagent we use, the precipitation means, first of all, the salt in question has to be precipitated, which means we have to add some water into it, and we use our uh, the precipitation reagent, which in this case, we are going to be using sodium hydroxide. The reagent is the sodium hydroxide or ammonium hydroxide. So, in either of them, to identify what we're looking for. So... How is this done? Let's start. For us to be able to be effective in the identification of the cations in the lab, our knowledge of the colors that these various cations exhibit is very important because if we're able to, uh, if we know the colors and whether they are, uh, they are soluble, in sodium hydroxide or ammonia, uh, ammonia solution, then we'll know exactly what the cation is. Let's take, for example, remember we have our test observation and inference. So if we want to test, for example, we have the zinc, lead, and aluminum give us white precipitate, okay? And copper is blue. We have ion 2 is green, light green. Ion 3 is reddish brown, and so on and so forth. So now... How are we going to do this? In the laboratory, I want to give us an overview. You should take note of that. In the lab, for example, in our test, let's say a sample which is unknown, we call it sample A. They will ask you to add a little water in that sample. It is in the test to a little water in it to make it to precipitate it. Then we add sodium hydroxide. We want to use sodium hydroxide, okay? When we add sodium hydroxide, in it, in drops, because we want to see whether it is soluble or insoluble. But you have to be adding it slowly so that um, it does some of the this uh, salt dissolve at the instant in which you add it. So you must be careful while you're adding it. So when we add our sodium hydroxide in drops and we get white gelatinous precipitate in drops, which is soluble in excess of sodium hydroxide, the Inference here, that is the observation, is the white gelatinous precipitate in drop, which is soluble in excess of sodium hydroxide. That is observation, what we observe. Now, our inference would be either uh, zinc, lead, or aluminum. These three guys are soluble in excess of sodium hydroxide. 
So when in drops, it gives you a wide precipitate. You see the precipitate means it's not soluble yet in drop, but while we continue to add in excess, the precipitate will dissolve. So that will tell you that it is either zinc, lead, or aluminum present. All right. So what if when we add our sodium hydroxide solution in the test tube, and we get a dirty white precipitate. Okay, the, when we get a dirty white precipitate in dross, which is insoluble in excess of sodium hydroxide, that, that is calcium. Calcium gives us a dirty white precipitate in drops, which is insoluble in excess of sodium hydroxide, it is not soluble. So we know that it is what? Uh, calcium. But what if uh, when we add our sodium hydroxide in drops, it gives us blue precipitate? which is insoluble in excess of sodium hydroxide. So in drops, it gives us blue gelatinous precipitate, which is also insoluble in excess of sodium hydroxide or excess sodium hydroxide, okay? That tells you it is copper. Copper gives you the blue gelatinous precipitate in drops, which is insoluble in excess of what? Sodium hydroxide. The ion 2, is what it gives us light green precipitate in drops, which is insoluble in excess of sodium hydroxide. So even ion three, ion two, sorry, is insoluble in drop and in excess of sodium hydroxide. Then ion three gives us reddish brown precipitate in drops, which is insoluble in excess of what sodium hydroxide. So all of these, when you see this observation, you know your inference to be ion 3 present or ion 2 for the green present or copper present. Then for uh, ammonia, when we want to test for ammonia, when we add sodium hydroxide in drops, when we add sodium hydroxide, there is no reaction. Okay, there is obviously no reaction. But on warming means you should heat it. On warming, it gives us a gas which turn a, which turn reddish which turn red uh, uh, run red uh, uh, litmus paper blue. All right, it gives us a gas which turn red litmus paper blue. That evolution of a gas which turn red litmus paper blue, and give us when we add uh, corn HCl. It forms dense white fumes with HCl. We know that ammonia is present. By the way, in our acid and base chemistry, we know that uh, acid, okay, uh, turn red litmus paper. We talk about blue litmus paper, red is acidic. Red litmus paper, blue is basic. So our only alkaline gas is ammonia. So if you turn red litmus paper blue, we know that we're talking about, okay, yeah, we're talking about ammonia. So with this, we can know when we have this knowledge in our head, we can easily detect what the uh, observation is and we can easily detect the inference without going back. Remember I said it's going to be in this form. It's going to be in this form, test, observation, and inference. So in the test, let's take, for example, I say sample A plus sodium hydroxide in drops, then in SS. When I did that, the observation is white gelatinous precipitate in drops, which is soluble in SS. Okay, that is my observation. My inference, I will know that it's either aluminum 3 plus, zinc 2 plus, or lead 2 plus present. Because from what I have said so far, we know the observation for these cations. And as soon as it happens in my test tube, I know exactly what that will be. Okay, if one of the reagents is ammonia, which we use to identify our cations, I just finished talking about uh, sodium hydroxide. Let's see 
what would these various cations give us when we use ammonia solution? So when we add in our sample in the test tube, we add our ammonia solution, we get white gelatinous precipitate in drops, which is soluble in excess of ammonia solution. We say it is zinc. So only zinc is soluble in ammonia solution. But in sodium hydroxide, zinc, lead, and aluminum are soluble. But in ammonia solution, only zinc is soluble. So we'll be able to know the difference when we're dealing with this, okay? So that is for that. Then in the next aspect, after we're done with the zinc, now when we have white gelatinous precipitate in drops, which is insoluble in excess of ammonia solution, then we have lead or aluminum present. All right? Lead or aluminum present. So lead and aluminum are not soluble in ammonia solution, but they were soluble in what? Sodium hydroxide solution. So we must know the difference. What about copper? It will give us our light blue gelatinous precipitate in drops, which is soluble in excess of ammonia solution to form a deep blue solution. Remember, copper was insoluble when we're dealing with sodium hydroxide, but with ammonia solution, it is soluble to even form a deep blue solution. So we should know that exactly our inference is copper 2 ion present. Ion 2 will still give us our green precipitate in dross, which is insoluble in excess of what ammonia solution. Ion 3 will still give us our reddish brown precipitate, which is insoluble in excess of ammonia solution. So ion 2 and ion 3 are still insoluble in both sodium hydroxide and in ammonia solution. Why? When there is no reaction at all, we know it's either calcium or ammonia present or ammonium hydroxide present. So calcium and ammonium hydroxide do not react with uh, ammonia solution. So with this in mind, we can easily identify the cations which we're dealing with in either whether we use the sodium hydroxide or the ammonia solution. With that fervent knowledge, we wouldn't have any problem when we're dealing with it. All right, so that is going to be our guiding principle, our guiding line or light, if you want to call it, when we are running for the test for cation. So when you get into the lab right now and I ask you, for example, take sample A, which I only know what sample A is. I tell you sample A plus uh, sodium hydroxide solution and you put your sodium hydroxide, there's no reaction and you're asked to warm it. And on warming, a gas was given off which turned red litmus paper blue and formed dense white fumes we call uh, then dense white fumes we call HCl you know perfectly that the uh, inference is ammonia and the same will go if you are dealing with ion 2 ion 2 uh, or uh, ion 2 ion where you, when you add that you have a green precipitate in drugs which is insoluble in Excess of sodium hydroxide, you know it's ion too. Or if, if you are using ammonia, you still get that, you know it's ion too because the boat will give you ion too. But what's the difference between sodium hydroxide and ammonia solution in terms of ion? In terms of ion, when it gives you that green precipitate in drug which is insoluble in the excess of sodium hydroxide solution, when you leave it for a time being, all right, the green turns to brown, becomes brown which is oxidation has taken place in it. So that's the difference. So these are the various principles or reagents which we use to identify for, or identify the presence of what cations in our various samples. So what about anions? Anions are the acid radicals. Now, the anions are the acid radicals that are present in aqueous solution can be identified by using some precipitating and oxidizing reagent. So let us now look at uh, certain uh, anions. How can we identify them? When we know how to identify them, you know exactly what you're dealing with. 
So let's take for example, we have the tetrazo sulfate 6 ion. In tetrazo sulfate 6 ion, we add barium chloride. When we add barium chloride first to the sample, which contains what we're dealing with, so we see sample A plus barium chloride, we get a white gelatinous precipitate, all right? When we have white gelatinous precipitate, what are the things we should be suspecting to be present? We're suspecting SO4 to minus, SO3 to minus, Cl minus, X to minus, CO3 to minus. Okay, the carbonate, the sulfate, and the sulfide, and all that. This could be present. But that is not all. Now, if we have gotten this white gelatinous precipitate as our observation, we proceed further to add HCl, dilute HCl in essence. When we add, uh, followed by dilute HCl, the white precipitate is insoluble in excess of dilute HCl. Well, once it is insoluble in dilute HCl, we know that it is SO42 minus present because tetrazosulfate 6 ion is insoluble in excess hydrochloric acid, dilute hydrochloric acid. And that is that. Okay, what about if we want to uh, test for triazosulfate 4 ion, SO3, 2 minus? We're still going to add our barium chloride to the sample. Yeah, this is our sample, or uh, the test tube. Let's see if I have any test tube here. If this is my test tube, I'm testing for, uh, how do you call it? Triazosulfate 4 ion. This is my test tube and a sample, an unknown sample, which I don't know. Let's say it is uh, the triazosulfate 4 ions. You take a little of it, precipitate it with a little water in it. When we add our barium chloride, we get a white precipitate will be formed. Obviously, white precipitate, we are suspecting SO3 2 minus, SO4 2 minus, CO3 2 minus, X minus. These are the things we are suspecting, okay? Now, we don't know which of them is present, so we have to move further, okay? We add dilute HCl in SS. When we add dilute HCl then, in that precipitate, which was white precipitate, now the precipitate, the white precipitate becomes soluble. When it is soluble, we know the two things that can give us that solubility will be SO3 2 minus and CO3 2 minus. So now, how are we going to know if it is CO3 or SO3? We have to proceed by adding a little uh, uh, dilute H2SO4 followed by KMNO4. Okay, the KMNO4, which is uh, tetra ozo manganate 7. When we add a, a solution of uh, dilute tetra ozo manganate 7, it turns the purple color of the KMNO4 become colorless. So, which means it decolorizes it. All right, and when that happens, we know that it is SO3 2 minus and nothing more. Okay, so that is how we'll be able to identify that it is what our SO3 2 minus. Now, let's, what about if we're testing for triazonitrophite ion? Triazonitrophite ion. We say to the sample, this is my test tube and the sample is in. When I add to that sample which I'm having, you add freshly prepared ion 2 tetrazosulfate 6 acid. When I have added it, you slant the test tube and gradually add concentrated H2SO4 tetrazosulfate 6 acid down the walls of the test tube to the base and ensure that it does not mix. And when that happens, a brown ring is formed at the interface between the two solutions. You know that it is NO3 minus. That is it. Now, why do we have to add freshly prepared ion 2 tetrazosulfate 6? We just prepare it before we use it. It is because when you prepare it and keep, it undergoes what? Oxidation. Okay? It will not be good. It is oxidized from ion 2 to ion 3. So in that case, we use freshly prepared. We prepare and use. Now, that is that about uh, the NO3 ion. Now, if we want to test for the chloride ion, to the solution, I put my solution here, you add 
silver nitrate. When you add silver nitrate, it gives you white gelatinous precipitate or white precipitate will be formed. The things that will come to mind are our Cl minus. We have our X2 minus or SO3 2 minus. These are the inference that can give us white precipitate with silver nitrate. Now, we proceed to add dilute uh, HNO3 trosonitrate 5 acid. When we add dilute trosonitrate 5 acid to that solution already, that precipitate is insoluble. Okay, which we are now, we say if it is insoluble, we confirm chlorine. But that is not all. We have to certify it. Now, to that insoluble white precipitate, we now add dilute aqueous ammonia solution. When we add aqueous ammonia solution, the white precipitate becomes soluble. And where once it becomes soluble, chlorine further confirmed. <music>
three, it is soluble. Then when we move further, when we add our HCl, we realize that the Y precipitate is soluble. In order to confirm that we are dealing with SO3, we have to add Kong, not Kong, dilute H2SO4, followed by KMNO4, which is decolorized. For SO4, we don't need to go for that. As it's insoluble in dilute H2SO, in dilute HCl, we know that it's SO4. Why the test for chlorine or chloride ion, bromide, and, and, uh, and iodide, we all just have to add our silver nitrate, which will give us white for chlorine, uh, pale yellow for bromine, and yellow for iodine. And when we add our uh, triazonitri 5 ion for uh, chlorine, it is insoluble for bromine, it is insoluble for iodine, it is insoluble. When we add our ammonia solution for chlorine, it becomes soluble. For iodine, it becomes, for bromine, it becomes partially soluble. For iodine, it remains insoluble. And we say for the test for carbonate, we add our HCl, which gives us an evolution of a gas, which when tested with lime water, it turns it milky. We say that gas is CO2 from a carbonate compound. So far, we've been able to cover the basic things. This lecture, I have done it already, which I wrote a whole lot of stuff on the board, qualitative analysis from part one to part five or six, if not mistaken. This is an overview that you should know as soon as you get into the lab. For example, those in the West African uh, senior certificate exam, when they want to write the exam, you have to deal with the qualitative aspect of that practicals. But when you have this common knowledge of what you're going to get when you add this, or once you see this region, you know what they are asking you, you it, it, it gives you an edge over your uh, your counterpart or your colleagues, and that makes you more confident before you even start. So it is pertinent that you have to go through this review and have this formal knowledge in you. So when you get into your lab, you know exactly what you're dealing with. You can never be confused. And that will make you um, a powerful chemist, if you ask me. So that is that about that for today. Please, you do have a wonderful time, like I said earlier on. We're going to have the practical class where I'm going to carry out these reactions. You see them uh, physically so that um, when you're dealing with yours, you know exactly what you're dealing with. Do have a wonderful time. Thank you.